All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the annual Minori Yasui Legacy event held on his birthday, which is today. Uh, I'm Anna, this year's Minori Yasui Fellow and the moderator for today's discussion. This year, we are so excited to be able to host an online panel discussion featuring some very important individuals who contribute, continue to honor the life and embody the values of Minori Yasui. In this panel, you'll hear about them, their connection with Minori Yasui, and how they aim to uphold the values of him in this current day and age. Many of you may be familiar with Minori Yasui's legacy. For those of you who are not, Minori Yasui graduated from the University of Oregon with both a BA and JD. As a young attorney, he challenged laws that discriminated against people of Japanese descent during World War II. He went on to have a lifelong career as a champion of civil rights. Posthumously, President Barack Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. While we welcome and encourage engagement and discussion for today, we have a few guidelines to help facilitate today's discussion. Please see the message in the chat for details on that. Also, before we get started, I would like to mention that there's a writing contest open to middle and high schoolers organized by the Minori Yasui Legacy Project and the Japanese American Museum of Oregon details of which are also in the chat. With that, I would like to introduce our three wonderful panelists for today. First, unfortunately, Ms. Yasui is not going to be able to join us today. Ms. Yasui did prepare some thoughts for today and Peggy Nagayo has graciously offered to join us today to share her thoughts. Peggy Nagayo has worked as a criminal and civil trial attorney, served as the Assistant Dean of Academic Affairs at the University of Oregon School of Law and founded her own consulting firm in 1988. Ms. Nagai was the lead attorney in Yasui versus United States, reopening Mr. Yasui's Supreme Court case for violating the curfew imposed upon Japanese Americans during World War II. Next, we have Lauren Kessler, an award-winning author. She has written 10 books of narrative nonfiction, which include Stubborn Twig, a story that chronicles the story of three generations of the Yasui family immigration story, including their internment during World War II. Our third panelist is Bill Waterman, uh, who graduated from the University of Oregon with a BS in 1977 and a JD in 1982. After a career in private practice, Bill Waterman now teaches at the John F. Kennedy School of Law at North Central University. In 2012, Bill and Marie Waterman established the Minori Yasui Student Fellowship. We have about an hour today, and I would love to get started, um, starting with Ms. Peggy Nagai, followed by Lauren Kessler and Bill Waterman. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of their remarks, so please feel free to send those in at any time. Um, Peggy, if you would like to get started. Thanks, Anna. Thanks a lot. And I look forward to, I'm so happy to be here with Bill and Lauren uh, and happy to talk uh, to you or pro provide you with Holly's remarks. So it, it's in the first person because it's written from Holly. So uh, one of the first things that she was asked to do is why did you decide to invest time? into the legacy of your father, you know, by writing, by making a film, etc. And here's what Holly said. She said, I'll explain um, a little about the creation of my film, Never Give Up, Minari Yasui and the Fight for Justice, which I hope that the participants in, in this webinar have had an opportunity to watch. So I don't know if you have, but you can, and it's free, so please do. The, the project started in 2013, when Holly attended the Japanese American National Museum's annual convention, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which was the passage of the redress bill for Japanese Americans. Uh, Holly says, my father was a leader in the JACL redress uh, committee to which he devoted the last years of his life. I remember very clearly how he traveled from coast to coast attending meetings, giving speeches and interviews, speaking out passionately at universities, churches, community centers, politicians' offices, and other events. In 1983, my dad reopened his legal case, challenging the government orders that implemented the forced removal and imprisonment of Japanese Americans using the writ of error quorum nobis that obviated the usual statute of limitations. 
1985, his wartime conviction was vacated and was on appeal um, to the Ninth Circuit for a full evidentiary hearing when he passed away. The US Supreme Court declined to hear the case. My dad's lead attorney on that case, which is me. <laughs> so, all right. So, my dad's lead attorney and I decided to work on the centennial celebration for Minya Sui's 100th birthday in 2016. Uh, Peggy spearheaded a campaign to nominate Minya Sui for a Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in this country, which was awarded to him posthumously in 2015. I agreed to make a documentary film, which I screened as a work in progress in my dad's hometown of Hood River on his 100th birthday, October 19th, 2016. It took me another two years to finish the film, which my co-director, Will Doolittle and I, um, felt should contribute to the ongoing conversations in the country about numerous human and civil rights violations under the Trump administration. Most notably, the Muslim ban, the separation and imprisonment of immigrant families, the Black Lives Matter movement, the oppression of indigenous groups protecting their water and their sacred lands. So what's the connection, uh, Holly was asked to respond to, what's the connection do you see between the discrimination Minori Asui and Japanese Americans experienced and recent incidents and political development um, against people of Asian descent, white supremacist activities, et cetera. So here's what she said. In 2017, the team of civil rights lawyers who reopened the World War II uh, cases, that is uh, Minya Sui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Fred Korematsu, we reconvened uh, in order to submit an amicus brief on the Muslim ban before the US Supreme Court. And in our brief, we argue that singling out and excluding people based on their ethnicity and national origin was repudiated by the quorum nobis cases and that the high court should overturn that race, this racist policy as a way of correcting uh, the badly decided World War II cases that allowed discrimination against Japanese Americans based on so-called military necessity, which was resurrected uh, in recent years to national security, a pretext for singling out and excluding a disfavored minority based on ancestry and national origin. Holly says, this year I finished the film, in, the year I finished the film in 2018, I also became involved with a national Japanese American movement called Sudu for Solidarity, which has as its goal to shut down the family detention centers in which immigrants seeking asylum, initially mostly Latin Americans, but recently many Haitians are imprisoned. We want to be allies that uh, we want to be the allies that our families needed, but did not have during World War II. Sudu for Solidarity has organized protests at the family detention centers at Dilly, Texas, Fort Still, Oklahoma, Burks, Pennsylvania, Tacoma, Washington, and most recently, the temporary detention center at Fort Bliss, Texas. She goes on to say an, uh, another aspect of anti-immigrant sentiment is perpetuated by those who stir up animus against Latinos and people of African heritage and people who look like them at our Southern border with a so-called great replacement theory. This is a white supremacist conspiracy, conspiracy theory that holds that current immigration policies, which are minimally more humane than those of the previous administration have as their goal, the replacement of whites with non-whites. Minoru Yasui would surely stand up and speak about uh, and against this racist, anti-democratic, anti-American attitude that was also expressed in the white nationalist rally held in Charlottesville, North Carolina in 2017. Anti-Asian hostility has a long and ugly history since Asian immigrants were not allowed to naturalize as US citizens. Um, Asians were excluded from parts of the West Coast 
lynched and massacred, massacred, alien land laws passed throughout the Western states in the early 1900s, completed the codification of anti-Asian sentiment into law. Min Yasui's parents were Japanese immigrants who suffered from this discrimination, which was a precursor to the wholesale violation of civil rights represented by the forced removal and imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Today, Min Yasui would surely stand up and speak out against the anti-Asian hate crimes that have surged in the wake of the COVID pandemic, which uh, irresponsible leaders have called the China, the China virus, Kung flu, and other monikers that blame Asians for the worldwide disaster. And uh, lastly, in the context of our history and current reality, what do you think Minero Yasui calls you and others to do? And Holly said, anti-immigrant, anti-Asian, and white supremacy sentiment, which I believe underlies voter suppression efforts, which make it harder for people of color to vote so that the dwindling white majority can hang on to its power, are the things that we need to be fighting um, against and fighting for democracy and uh, due process and equal protection. And as, as Anna mentioned, um, there is a Min Yasui student contest uh, in which for a high school student who wins will get a thousand dollars prize money. But the prompt for that is what are the duties, responsibilities uh, and or obligations of an individual or group in US society and taking a stand against racism and discrimination. So if you know high school and middle school students, please encourage them to apply. It's an essay form and uh, the date, uh, the deadline date is March the 1st. So those are Holly's words. Happy to answer questions later on, uh, but I'll pass it back to Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we have Lauren Kessler. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this um, celebration of Min's life and legacy. I actually came to know Min um, accidentally. Um, I was I had heard that his sister, I didn't even know who he was, but his sister Michi was invited back to the University of Oregon to go through the graduation ceremony that she was prevented from walking through in um, the spring of 1942 um, because it was in those days uh, in the evening. And um, as we know from what Min very bravely did, um, people who had a Japanese face, regardless of where they were born, um, were not permitted on the West Coast to be outside after dark. So Michi, who was a Phi Beta Kappa, um, was not allowed to walk through her graduation ceremony. Many, many, many years later, the archivist at the University of Oregon found correspondence between the University of Oregon, the Dean of Students, and the uh, head of the uh, Western Defense Command, essentially pleading to allow Michi to walk through. Um, and the answer was no. So fast forward, well, slow forward, many, many years later, and Michi comes to campus. And I live at the University of, I, lived, I used to live at the University of Oregon. Uh, I live in Eugene and I taught at the University of Oregon. Um, and her family comes too, of course. And that's how I first met Min. Um, and I wrote Michi's story, but it opened up immediately to the story of her family, um, including Min. I had been wanting since graduate school to write something about what it means to be an American. I'd taken probably the most meaningful history. I, I, I studied American history in, at the University of Washington. And um, there was a class that I took in history, a graduate class that was, what does it mean to be an American? And, um, I didn't know how to write about it in a personal, dramatic narrative way, which is what my writing is. 
um, until I met the Yasui family, because those three generations from the immigrant to the to Min's generation to Holly's generation was was really about the promise and the peril of becoming American. Um, so actually, I wasn't I didn't start out being interested. I shouldn't say that because it sounds cold, but I didn't start out with a interest to tell a Japanese American or Japanese story. I started out to tell an American story and, and that's what I hope I did. Um, Min spent a lot of time with me. I was able to spend time with him personally. And in the last months of his life, and I didn't actually know he was dying, he spent an enormous amount of time with me on the phone. Um, as articulate and energetic and, uh, I don't know, full of combrio is how we say, um, as ever. And then it came as a complete surprise to me that that was the end of his life. Um, I wanted very much in the book, which is Stubborn Twig, to um, cre recreate that moment that, um, that was a a fork in, in his um, career, in his life, in the life of his family, and in the history of our country. Um, and I, it's, uh, it's, it's very short, so I thought I would read just a tiny bit of it because it'll set you back to this moment. Um, and this is all from discussions with Min. And um, I also walked, I, I walked his walk. <laughs> Um, because he told me exactly where he walked. So, uh, the evening of March 28th, and this is March 28th, 1942, was cool and unseasonably dry. At his office in the Foster Hotel, Min neatened the piles of paper on his desk, reached for his overcoat, relit his pipe, and gave final instructions to his secretary, Ray. Notify the FBI, he told her, call the Portland police. Tell them a Jap is walking up and down the streets and he wants to be arrested. At exactly eight o'clock, Min closed the door to his law office and set out to break the law. Calmly and purposefully, he walked up and down Portland's Third Avenue, expecting at any moment to be arrested for violating the curfew order. That's the order to not be out at night. But the minutes stretched into an hour, an hour into two, and still he walked free. At 10 o'clock, he saw a patrolman up ahead and rushed to catch up with him. I, I just, when Min told me this, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's so serious, but funny, which is kind of what he was. Min pulled a copy of the curfew order from his pocket of his overcoat. This is military proclamation number three, he told the officer. It prohibits persons of Japanese ancestry from being away from their homes after eight o'clock. The cop said nothing. From his other pocket, Min took a copy of his birth certificate. See, he told the cop patiently, I am a person of Japanese ancestry. The cop just stood there. You should arrest me, Min insisted Min. The cop shook his head and sighed, run along home, you'll get yourself in trouble. So anyway, he continued to walk. He finally did get himself arrested, which was the purpose of this whole thing. And as I'm sure all of you know, that became, um, uh, he, he joined two other people um, of Japanese uh, descent to challenge the uh, outrageousness, uh, the hostility, um, the racism that was happening at that time. Um, which people say, you know, this generation or my children's generation, which might be the generation of some of the students uh, that are um, in here. When you study World War II, people say, and my dad said this, um, well, you've got to remember we were at war um, and we were afraid. And that's why it happened. We were at war, we were afraid, but you just have to look back at American history to see that this was not some isolated, war-related uh, singular act against uh, people of Japanese descent, or uh, it, it was part of a long string of racist rules, regulations, um, and attitudes of the US government. So 
At any rate, that day was very important. His case was important. His life was important. Um, but it's his legacy now. I mean, he, he, we celebrated his 100th birthday in 2016, I guess. So he was principled and he was bold. He was thoughtful. He was a man of his word. And um, his, his work and, and that courageous walk that he took around Portland is now almost 80 years ago. We need to not think of it, and I think Holly's words through Peggy made that very clear, of some you know, fascinating, bold, interesting thing that happened way back in history. And you know, yay for him, because that, that's not what it was. That's not what it opened up to us, and that's not what the challenge is of keeping that legacy alive. One of the things I've been thinking about a whole lot, and perhaps all of you have, is this notion that um, now has a name called identity politics. And um, when I think about, about what Min did, he was obviously carrying a, something in his pocket that said, I am a person of Japanese ancestry, but he was standing up for the constitutional rights of all. It wasn't identity politics, it was democracy. And what came to mind when I was thinking about this, not so much when I wrote the book, but when I was thinking about my remarks for today, is um, a, a very famous poem um, that is short that I wanna to read to you that was written by a um, Lutheran German pastor who at first supported Adolf Hitler and then um, got woke. And here's what he wrote. And this will sound familiar. First they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I'm not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. So Min was speaking out for all of us and the way that we honor that legacy is to continue to do that. Not because we are Japanese American or Greek American or African American or any slash American, but because we are people who believe in democracy, freedom, individual rights, the health of communities, ethical behavior, integrity, and all of those things that we need to remind ourselves that we are and perhaps relearn after um, the horrible thing that happened to our country um, from 2016 to 2020. That's all I have. Um, and I'm happy to answer more. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just want to say that um, I have written, I, should, I think she said 10 books, actually it's more like 15 now. And Stubborn Twig remains um, so much in my heart and in my head. Um, as does this miraculous family that is both ordinary and extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, next, we will have Bill Waterman speak. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Lauren, Professor Kessler. Um, so I'm Bill Waterman and I wanted to share a little bit about, first of all, uh, me and my wife, Marie, and a little bit about this uh, fellowship that, that we created a number of years ago for uh, helping Oregon law students especially uh, study and, and learn something about civil and human rights and to further uh, their careers. 
Uh, I did choose law as my career, but I went through a personal odyssey. Uh, I grew up in the 60s in a uh, largely Caucasian white community here in the East Bay in San Francisco Bay Area. And I witnessed the civil rights movement from, from afar, not, not personally, um, but from afar and didn't really appreciate the uh, sense of, of what discrimination was like, what the sting of di discrimination felt like for people in the civil rights movement and uh, throughout our country. Um, I did recently, by the way, find out that my family has Jewish uh, origins and Jewish heritage. And I found out only recently that my uh, father and mother were discriminated against, it turned out, because they tried to join a country club in our town and uh, they were denied uh, uh, the right to join as members, uh, largely as we've reconstructed it uh, because of their, uh, my dad's Jewish ethnicity. Anyway, back to me. So I came to the U of O, I'm a double. Um, I attended undergrad and law school. And as an undergrad, I studied history and especially was interested in the post-Civil War Reconstruction era and the emergence of what we now know as Jim Crow, the laws of institutionalized discrimination. I also like to study the labor movement and uh, urban history. So I graduated, became a high school teacher, and I taught in Eastern Oregon. And one of the things I uh, uh, observed in my teaching work was that there was a kind of a profound level of of, of uh, lack of appreciation or education about minorities, people of color, uh, and a lack of diversity, truly. So I tried to shock sometimes and expose my students to um, the history of discrimination. Um, one time I played a movie for them. Uh, it was about famous black inventors. And they were shocked that persons of color were fantastic engineers, um, inventors, et cetera. Uh, and it just brought back to me that my role as a teacher uh, was to help them understand our history much better. So I then go to law school. Uh, my goal was to help people. That's why I wanted to be a lawyer. And I studied con law, labor law. I liked those a lot. I did well at trial advocacy and decided to go on to be a trial attorney. Uh, and so I've spent my 30 years uh, practicing as a lawyer and now work as a mediator. And so I'm engaged in conflict resolution. And along the way, um, during law school, I met or at least talked to uh, Min Yasui. It was before the internet, so we didn't have video chat, but I did talk to him. And it was strange, kind of mystic, how I heard about him. One of my fellow students uh, and law professors had mentioned something to me uh, and suggested that I, uh, I try to contact him. And I was interested in writing an uh, article, an interview for our, our famous newspaper. For those of you at, at school, you can check it out. It was called The Descent. There might be a few issues laying around in the library. So I wrote a story about men. And what I was struck by was what uh, Professor Kessler and what Peggy have both shared about his fiery determination to stand up um, against discrimination as a lawyer. And in his case, representing himself in pro per. So I wrote this story, very modest story, and then it went away. I didn't think about men for many years. And also in the 1970s, I encountered uh, for me a personal uh, benefit was a practice of Buddhism. And I became a member of what's called today the SGI, means Soka Gakkai International. And our um, current president, who's 93, Mr. Ikeda, Daisaku Ikeda, he's uh, the third in a string of presidents in our organization. And the first two presidents were in prison during World War II for their determination to speak out against um, people's individual rights, the rights to practice their own religion and uh, for human rights and against the militarist um, power of, of, of Japan. And after coming out of prison, uh, the second gentleman, Mr. Toda, Mr. Makaguchi, his mentor passed in prison. 
Mr. Toda came out with a fiery determination, maybe in some ways a lot like Min Yasui's, to stand up for people's individual and human rights. And so over the years, our SGI movement has been engaged in this process of helping people establish their own happiness through what we call human revolution. And I'd just like to read a quote that it kind of summarizes why I think Min Yasui's life and his, you know, as I say, the fiery determination, it also co corresponds with this concept in Buddhism. It's called dependent origination. And Mr. Ikeda writes, he says, the misfortune of others is our misfortune. Our happiness is the happiness of others. To see ourselves in others and feel an inner oneness and sense of unity with them represents a fundamental revolution in the way we view and live our lives. Therefore, discriminating against another person is the same as discriminating against oneself. When we hurt another, we are hurting ourselves. And when we respect others, we respect and elevate our own lives as well. Um, so I go to law school and I practice law for 30 years. I'm from a Caucasian family in a Caucasian community. What can I do to help others in the uh, struggle to protect everyone's human and civil rights? So I started thinking about this in about 10 years ago. And I thought, well, what can I offer? And what I can offer is to try to help even just one law student like Anna, uh, you know, use this a rare experience to study law and learn about it and help, help them study, help them in law school. So we decided to make our stand and um, in the name of men, create the Minusui Fellowship for Civil and Human Rights. Um, and so that was sort of how I started my mission to uh, give back and contribute. Um, the second question we're talking about today is this question of, uh, I call it then and now, um, which is we are now again facing this, um, again, situation of rampant discrimination and fear and, and hatred. And when, when our teacher, Mr. Uh, Ikeda came to the first time to the United States in 1960 to share things about this Buddhist practice, he experienced a uh, firsthand an, uh, an event that showed the discrimination in the United States. This is way back in 1960, where he was at Lincoln Park of all places in Chicago and he saw this situation where these boys were kicking this ball around. And these were Caucasian boys and groups of other white boys would come and join the, the party, if you will. And there was this African-American young boy standing off to the side and nobody asked him to join. And at some point there was also a, a older gentleman standing nearby watching, encouraging these boys. And at one point, the African-American boy laughed when another boy, one of the white boys fell down. And this white gentleman came up to him and started screaming at this African-American boy, seven or eight years old, screaming at his face. And the young boy, African-American boy then took off. And this registered with Mr. Ikeda. And after watching all of this, he, uh, he said, I will make a determination to uh, address racism in the world and in the United States and do my best to help do something about this. And he wrote in a, a book called The New Human Revolution, he said, there was no other solution to the problem of racial discrimination than reali realizing a human revolution in each individual. In other words, an inner transformation in the depths of people's lives to transform the egoism that justifies the subjugation of others and replace it with a humanism that strives for coexistence among all peoples. And so how can we today you know, stand up? What would, what would men uh, Yasui call on us to do? Well, I personally believe, and I'll stop in a minute, 
I personally believe that in our own ways, each of us has a mission to uh, deal with discrimination or acts of, um, of discrimination and fear. Um, in my law practice, I've tried to uh, even just a little bit in, in effect, like the pebble going into the pond, sending the ripples. I believe that in our daily life, we can make a difference in all of our actions. Uh, even as an insurance defense attorney, I would often uh, make my goal to seek justice in my cases, even though I represented the defendant and the insurance carrier, because I believe that in little ways we can make a difference. And in one of my cases, I helped um, achieve a settlement that I've never forgotten about where a gentleman had a crushed ankle from an accident and had to have his ankle fused where all the bones were fused together. And he could no longer work as an electrician. But during the, the case and during the uh, mediation, it became clear that he really wanted to return to work. That was his goal. So as a defendant, we found a way to fund his ability to do just that and to return to work and get voc, voc re rehabilitation. And I just thought that was an example of where what I did made some difference in achieving a just result in that one case. And so today I teach um, conflict resolution and mediation and torts and other fun subjects in law school. And I also work in conflict resolution. So I feel that that's my role and my mission to, to, do, to address uh, injustice or injustice and help resolve conflict. And finally, and lastly, I will say this, um, Peggy and I have talked about this, that we would like to create a center for the study uh, and practice of civil and human rights law at uh, Oregon Law. And so this is something that would be our dream and our goal in the future to do. So we have, we have a lot of work to do to achieve that, uh, that mission, if you will. But that's something that we would like to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank all three of our wonderful panelists today for offering their insightful um, and unique remarks and perspectives. Uh, we have a couple questions in the discussion chat. Um, I'd love to go through them. I can also just uh, wait a minute for some more questions to come in, but if not, we can just get started. Uh, first up, we have a question from a student, and she asks, how can we continue to educate and engage others with the legacies of people like Minori Yasui when the education system fails to teach these stories? Well, I'm going to take a first crack at that, but Lauren really uh, can talk a lot more about that, given she is a professor. But, you know, the thing is that we didn't learn that. We didn't learn them either. And so there's, there's like a structural... Uh, reconstruction of what should be taught that could happen. Um, but I think, I think in every conversation, people, people can be teaching history. Um, in other words, you're, we're doing this today, but I think it's less about, it's more about what are we willing to do to stand up, to learn, to say something, to bring events like this uh, into the forefront. Uh, because if we wait for institutions to do that, uh, we're, we're going to be waiting until the next century at least. So uh, I would suggest to picket, to boycott, to do all those things that are really important for students to do at a, at a law school, at a university. Uh, and uh, also, you just have to do it on your own with events like this. So um, I will just jump in and say two sort of opposite things. One is each one teach one, which is, comes out of the civil, the, the old civil rights movement. So it is our embedded responsibility, each one teach one. On the other hand, this is not about you not being a racist. This is about an institutionalized system that goes through what we learn in school, that goes through criminal justice, that goes through the healthcare system. And it's wonderful for us to each take personal responsibility. And I'm not suggesting that we should not, 
but I'm also suggesting that that doesn't let anybody off the hook. So congratulations if you have great diversity in your friendships and you don't see color, which is an interesting idea. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about here. This is way bigger. It's a struggle that started a long time ago and it will continue and it needs to continue. I do have faith in us um, as a people. Um, so I think it will happen, but it is personal responsibility, community responsibility, institutional responsibility. And now I'm getting mute right here. Oh, just to, to chime in on what Professor Kessler said there, and, and Peggy, um, Ms. Nagai, thank you. Uh, I think this concept that I talked about of human revolution is that um, you know, each of us has infinite potential, each human being, um, and each person deserves respect. So that's our personal challenge in our daily life, right? How do we live that way? How do we work to improve ourselves um, learn and and listen to people, which is a big part of conflict resolution. And that that's our own individual mission. Um, I do believe personally that that even doing that does make a difference in society. Um, but if you're a teacher, uh, you have this special responsibility. And um, you know, I don't know if, if you the question or if you are specifically an educator. Uh, but, you know, you have an, an immense uh, mission and responsibility that you can bring to your work. So I don't know if that helped at all. Thank you so much. Um, switching gears a little bit, this one's a comment from Jeffrey Beaver. They say, Yasui, Korematsu, and Hirabayashi were three, but let's not forget Mitsuya Endo, the only woman of the four. Um, I'm thinking this is in reference to just like the four big U.S. Supreme Court cases about Japanese Americans. I'm not entirely familiar with all four, um, but I think it is good to recognize um, all four. So thank you, Jeffrey, for that comment. And let me just say, Anna, that Jeffrey worked on uh, the Yasui case when he was a student at the U of O, and he worked on the Hirabayashi case as a lawyer in Seattle. Uh, but the Endo case was uh, Mitsui Endo uh, filed a uh, uh, habeas corpus uh, case while she was incarcerated at uh, in I can't remember what camp she was in, um, and they did, the Supreme Court did find that you couldn't have indefinite detention, uh, but they found it only after and they they uh, read the opinion or had the opinion only after the camps were closed. And the next election happened. Uh, so, and those were not an accident, any of those things, but absolutely, Jeffrey Mitsui Endo was an important case, an important person, especially as a Japanese American woman. Okay, um, I'm just going to go ahead and move to the next question. Uh, it is as law students and eventual lawyers. What are some actions or organizations in the Oregon area that we can be a part of to begin working on and learning more about these issues? Uh, Lauren, are you still in Oregon? Can... Yeah. Um, hi, Peggy. Hi. <laughs> um, yes, I, um, I still am in Oregon. I live in Eugene. Um, I um, stopped teaching at the School of Journalism at the University of Oregon and began mm -hmm. teaching in a um, master's program at the University of Washington for the last two years that's been remote. Mm -hmm. So um, I continue to live here is the answer, but I do not teach. Um, I'm not on campus teaching anymore at mm -hmm. that campus. Yeah. So I think that some of the things that uh, people can do to get involved, uh, there, there's so, let's see, there's so many things going on and then it's hard to say what to do exactly. 
but if you look at uh, some websites, if you look at the uh, PANA website, Asian Pacific Network of Oregon, they're doing things. If you look at the Minyasui Legacy Project uh, website, we're doing things. If you look at other websites, uh, Chicano, uh, Latino, African American, Black Lives Matter, they're doing things. But I, I also think that you should look in Eugene to see what can you do what can you do in Eugene at the local level on campus? What's going on on campus where you can uh, make a difference in, in your area? Uh, but if you want specific uh, suggestions, email me. I'd be happy to tell you what you can do because we need more people working on these issues. So Anna, I'm happy to give out my email address or you can give it out to people uh, to, to let them know. Great, thank you so much. Um, we actually did a documentary screening last week and uh, Amy Yogi, the co-president of the Lane County um, Asian American Association, or Japanese American Association was there. So there's always those types of organizations as well. We often do joint programming with the school. Um, there's lots of organizations um, just to, to get started and things like that. Um, is it all right if I move on to the next question? Okay, great. Um, the next question is, how would you advise budding lawyers who enter fields or offices with discriminatory or racial practices work in those fields or with those individuals while trying to make changes? No, I think you should field this. <laughs> I'll just tell people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like if I heard right, sorry to sound like a media, if I heard it right, I think your question is, what should you do or could you do if you experience an act of discrimination or uh, unfairness, mistreatment in, in any law firm um, or in, in a law firm where you are? First of all, I'd say that's too bad. I'm sorry that you're experiencing that personally. Um, I, I haven't directly experienced that myself, but I can say this. Um, I experienced uh, people that were taken advantage of in terms of wage and hour laws. Um, and they were not paid uh, as they should have been. It was a, a, in, in effect a discrimination based on people working uh, off the clock. They were working overtime and weren't paid for it. This, these are staff members of a law firm that I worked in. And uh, I did object to it after I'd had enough and I spoke out. And I spoke to, uh, I was working for a large insurance company and I spoke out to senior management, ultimately to the vice president for claims. Um, as a result, they, they took action and changed the practice. Uh, I personally experienced some blowback from that, some retaliation, if you will, um, but I still would still do it uh, every second. I never regretted doing that. And so I would say that personally that it, uh, it can affect your career if you do speak out in, in law firms sometimes. I won't say I'm naive to think otherwise, but I think it's worth doing in a way that you're comfortable with or even slightly uncomfortable with uh, to speak out and say, I don't understand why this is happening. And I would really like to have a conversation, conversation about it. What do you think, Peggy? A conversation. Well, what I would say is that Minyasui was 25 years old and the first Japanese American member of the Oregon uh, uh, Bar, State Bar, when he in intentionally violated the curfew. I served as assistant dean under Derek Bell uh, at, the, at the law school, and Derek was the first Black law dean outside of historically Black law school. Uh, and he worked with Thurgood Marshall doing desegregation cases at the Inc. Fund. And what I learned from them is that if I don't speak out, who will? Mm -hmm. And if, if not now, and especially after George Floyd's murder and everything that's gone down and anti-Asian violence, when? Uh, and I would say that 
I have learned to speak out. I mean, I was raised on a farm in boring Oregon, uh, and it wasn't the, the breeding ground for speaking out and doing civil rights work. So, and Lauren's laughing. So if I can do that, anyone can do that. And that is that, uh, and I believe that lawyers can be the first responders for justice. And in fact, I gave a commencement speech at the U of O uh, two years ago. And that's what I said is that lawyers can be the first responders for justice. And that every time I've spoken out in my life or left a job because I disagreed with the values uh, and I disagreed with the practices, it opened more doors than it closed, but I didn't know that. You have to do it based, you know, you get to the edge of the cliff and either you're gonna learn how to fly or there's gonna be another step there. But I think that is the value and the preciousness of life and integrity and human, uh, human integrity. I'm sure you have something to say about this, Laura. <laughs> um, you know, the, so Peggy and me and Bill are, um, uh, we, can, we can speak across a, a sort of a career and a life. And I think that at the, at the moment, when you're at the beginning of a career or you're like the first female full-time professor in school in the 100 year uh, history of the School of Journalism. Well. Um, and you think number one, the burden is enormous. So I have to be way better than anybody else. And also um, I can't really speak out because you know, I can't speak out. And but if you, so, so it's great for us to say, you know, if you don't, I will say, if you don't, you'll regret it. You know, at the time it's so scary and you're thinking, I'm just starting, they might fire me, this is gonna be terrible. But you know what, 30 years later, you're gonna to have to look yourself in the mirror and say, I did not do that. There was a moment when not just standing up for myself, but not with, I hope with antagonism, but with some purpose and integrity, making a statement. That is, is what you'll regret, you know? So when I first started at the University of Oregon, being the only female, not on campus, but in the school, um, about a year or two years after I started, let me say, yeah. So I, I became pregnant with my first child and, um, the men in my department felt that it was perfectly fine um, to reach out and touch my stomach. Oh, wow. And I, and so part of me thought, you know, these are my, they're, they're my elders. <laughs> they're sitting in judgment of me and they don't mean it in a bad way. They mean it in a loving way, but get your hands off my body now. And um, I am, as Peggy knows, I'm, and probably you all know from how I'm talking, I'm a blunt person. And it took everything in my power to not say with some expletives, get your hands off my body, but to just use that with some amount of kindness that I did not feel <laughs> just to explain that, that that was not okay. So that's, that's tiny but it was big for me at the time and it felt very dangerous for me at the time. In retrospect, how dangerous was it? I don't know. Would anybody have done anything? I have no idea. But I feel good now, 30 years later, having done that, it was important. So you have to be brave in the moment and take the consequences because the consequences of not being brave are much worse. So uh, and I, I wanted to just say one last comment, because one thing that Derek Bell said to me is that you have to do what's right, regardless of the personal cost. And that in the end, we won't be judged by the results we attained, but the quality of the struggle we maintain. And it is a struggle to maintain democracy and to maintain individual and human rights. Yeah, oh, well, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question and there's one comment uh, and then I think we can wrap up. Um, I'll just go ahead and ask a question from John. 
Uh, they're asking, does anyone know the status or progress of honoring Min Yasui on the UVO campus with the building name, statue, or the like? It seems to be stuck in a long committee process with other nominees. And hi to my former colleague, Peggy. Oh. That's that's an answer that you should have, Anna, not us. <laughs> we don't know. Well, I, I privately answered this with a snarky comment about how the um, committee work and um, bureaucracies and um, endless, endless discussions um, does not surprise me whatsoever that this is taking forever, um, as does pretty much everything. Um, there's no, I don't, what's the word? I mean, institutions are not nimble at all. They don't make decisions quickly or even like all that slowly. It's uh, anyway, so I, I would not read anything um, particularly negative about men or about this, but just that that is the way that universities and very large uh, organizations work. See, I said that without a lot of snark, but I. Yes, thank you. <laughs> But, and what I would say is for the people that want to get involved in something, you know, that first question was, how do we get involved or what can we get involved? That's something you can get involved with. And in fact, I didn't know this was going on. So I'm going to get the Minya Sui Legacy Project, hopefully, to get involved as well. And Bill Waterman, as a donor uh, at the U of O, can also get involved. Okay, we're starting a little movement here, Lauren. Yeah, get involved. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I also will say that it does feel like in recent years, the university has been trying to promote these Minori Yasui legacy events. And there is a lot of increasing kind of like attention and awareness towards um, like this fellowship in particular, and then also like the associated events. So hopefully we're going in the right direction. Um, okay, so one last comment, and then I think we can wrap up here. Uh, it is from Maya Yasui. I say thank you for sharing these personal stories with all of us. I am honored to have learned so much from each of these pre presenters, and particularly from Holly, my husband's cousin. Keeping men's legacy alive is crucial in our current political climate, and sadly, it seems into the foreseeable future. It takes visionaries like these amazing people. Maya Yesi. Uh, Maya is on the Min Yasui Legacy Project, and she is the local historian. She helped get so many things of men's in the library uh, and in the museum. Uh, she's a force of nature in, especially in Hood River, but all around the area. And as Lauren is shaking her head, yes, because she probably met with Maya a lot when she was in, uh, uh, researching for the book. But Maya, thank you for who you are and the leadership that you bring. I second and third that. Um, ditto and join that. <laughs> well, um, that seems like a good one to end it on. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of our wonderful panelists <laughs> for joining us today. A good ending. Yeah, that's a good, the dog thanks everybody as well. Yeah. I hope that was a dog and not like a child or something. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you all so much for joining us today. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Bill and Lauren. It's great to see both of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank, thank you, Anna, for moderating. Great job.